that should work now. Yeah, here we go. Sorry. So uh, until we have more panelists joining, um, I will just like briefly recap what we discussed yesterday internally, what we liked, what we didn't like about the workshop. I think overall worked out quite well. This uh, multi-day workshop with 12 hours content, I think we had a lot of fun there. Um, we chunked up the workshop in, in six different slices. Maybe next time we going to distribute it a little bit differently, like have runtime and orchestration maybe as a first section and then build and distribute instead of mixing them in another direction. And, um, oh, and now we have some some panelists as well. Hi, guys. Hey, Josh, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Um, yeah, so I was just recapping a little bit what we said yesterday. yesterday. Um, um, one time, one time. One time we might trim down a little bit because we know it already now it gets more and more in place. And we discussed having more use cases and more yeah, more use cases, more customers, or more, more application focus than our architectural focus that we had maybe last week. Yeah, so let's see, do we have a video yet? We have a couple of people watching, only a couple of them, but at least we have. Um, from yesterday's discussion, what do you guys, what do you guys think was mostly like what 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 stood out for you and what what didn't work that I didn't mention thus far? Jay, you said like the use case focus would be nice. Yeah, I think bringing in some more users that are playing with containers in interesting ways, understanding what they're trying to do and the challenges that they're hitting, particularly as they're exploring maybe new configurations. That would be really interesting to have a, an open panel to discuss, uh, particularly the issues, and so that you know, our community is a little you know more broadly informed of some of the the emerging challenges and some of those you know users might be hitting and that are relatively easy for us to try to address, right? Just the underlying plumbing, so. In particular, just to build on that, the idea of potentially for each session, identifying a particular user. So we know sort of who that particular persona is and uh, having the various presenters either during their presentation or uh, allude to how it's whatever it is that they're saying is relevant to that particular use case or using that as part of the panel wrap up to interact uh, with that particular use case in mind that reality. It would be interesting. Take work, take careful selection to be able to get such an appropriate user. But um, if you have the right person to represent the usage and a clear enough and relevant example, that could be pretty compelling. We wouldn't necessarily do it everywhere, but if you can get a really good candidate, then it could be worthwhile. You could also try it, you know, in a couple cases and see how it goes and, and maybe expand from there. We don't have to solve world hunger in one year. <laughs> no, we don't. Yeah. It would be nice to take care of Corona in one year, but you know, give it some more. Yeah, that's that's also a question. Like, do we have a? I mean, we all assume I think that we will have an uh, in-person uh, workshop next year, but maybe we don't. Nobody knows really. Uh, yeah. That's going to be interesting. I just think it's, it's very valid. And for the for the segments, maybe we can recap quickly what we yesterday. I think the one time I said. Was, uh, was was nice was um, we elaborated a long time on the on the on the panel maybe next time we want to shorten it a little bit because in our runtime I think are uh, already converging a little bit but maybe we still want to provide the status of it, so provide the status of Sotman similarity series and all the different ones to make sure everyone is on the same page maybe also status of the Building block that everyone has, like the high hope thing. Someone has a fair bit of background noise. I don't know whether we can find you. I think it's good. Here we go.
Yeah, it's Bill. Yeah, sorry, I thought I was already on mute. <laughs> Classic. Um, Hope the coffee's good though. <laughs> Where I'm, where I'm struggling, not struggling with, but I think where we need more, more, um, more reconsideration next year is uh, the build and distribute piece. I think um, maybe putting it also in the more use case oriented um, aspect, so that we say if you have a, a system that is air gap, a big system is only one cluster, and you want to build a container, you don't care maybe about OCI because you don't push it to an OCI registry, then we can focus on that from this perspective. And if you want to run it somewhere else where you want to distribute it between different registries, then you need to take care of this. So maybe shuffling it a little bit so that we we don't uh, go through all the different tools without a context of how these tools are assembled and used in a, in a, for, for a particular use case. That would be one idea. What do you guys think? I think it was a bit of a challenge to have the build and distribute separate because you had to cut down the discussion a couple of times because we were heading towards distribute while talking about build while you wanted to keep that separate so that, that was not ideal. Yeah, maybe we slice it not as build and distribute but build for the cluster and build for the cloud, I don't know, or build for distributed environments and build for Central environment, something like that. But yeah, that's to be discussed. I think that's something that we. Hey, you're sound, starting to sound like a use case focus there. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, careful. Uh, okay, and orchestration scheduling. I think that was was nice with the lens of uh, with the lens of container and workflow orchestration, which is fair, I think. But yeah, we, we talked a lengthy bit about traditional schedulers and how they interact. And I think we mo should make this part of the of the presentations and not only the, the panel. So that was a valuable feedback of maybe focusing more on how can we capture, how can, inter how can different schedulers interact and who is in charge of whom and uh, how can we maybe capture workflows how can we capture or how can we utilize this new hybrid models where you have a um, scheduler side by side with Slingshot, for instance, uh, the, the Shasta system. We have uh, Slurm and Kubernetes side by side. So how, and we will have, as we said, also at the panel, we will have experiences of those systems next year. So eventually we will, we will know more and have better insights on how this interacts. Yeah, and I just want to make sure though that, that it's not just the Shasta system, right? You know, so I'm from HPE, and that's all we ever think about. But, but you know, we we know that that the other systems or other system vendors face the same problem. So, um, I just don't want it to be a an HPE thing. I think it's across the across the HPC space and across the vendor space. Yeah, that's true. IBM has a similar thing with LSF and and Kubernetes, right? So. Facing similar problems, challenges, I suppose. Yeah, and it, it depends also what what is what is what is deployed in parallel, right? I think we talked about workflow managers a lot, and this is also a similar thing, right? It's not only down to the last scheduler that just assigns the task, but it's also how can we assemble different workflow managers to maybe do different pieces in a in a whole complete simulation or a whole workflow. I mean, we start with Argo and then we hand it off to Kubernetes and we hand it off to Slurm. Um, there are multiple ways of, of slicing this up. Yeah, and, and, and I think you already said it. I think next 12, 18 months, we'll, we'll start to see uh, really the, 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 the real use cases here and the real applications which want to make use of it. Today, I think it's a bit, uh, you know, uh, aspirational, but we'll see more coming up. Yeah, and I kind of view it as a bit of a leveling up for our HPC community. I think a couple of years ago, just getting into containers was a big hurdle. And I feel like the community is really kind of there. And now we're leveling up to more of a complex orchestration and workflows. People are looking at it and playing with it. And so I'm really interested to see what comes out of that, to see you know, where these useful companies are. Yep. Cool. 
Shane just joined as well. Thanks. And, and then what, what about trust? Question. Trust. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, right. So yeah, um, we had the secret uh, deal that instead of talking about security, we call it trust. So yeah, maybe we should also add security next time. That's uh, something that um, yeah, that uh, I promised somehow. So yeah, security might be another piece in the puzzle next year. So it came up several times, so I think it's something you, you shouldn't be trying to ignore because it's going to come up anyway. We might as well have a focused discussion on that you know, rather than just having, having it pop up everywhere. And that relates to the general topic, I think, of uh, systems, uh, the trend towards systems becoming more distributed. And as they become more distributed and also uh, not always connected, sort of more intermittently connected, then the notion of <clears throat> being able to reestablish, establish and reestablish trust and have a penetrated communication where data becomes increasingly uh, valuable. And because it's so valuable, it needs to be protected, encrypted, whatever, um, those become bigger issues. Yeah. Cool. Um, so security, then we don't need to call it trust, even though it's of course part of it. Uh, next time. Let's open a bag of chips here now. Okay, cool. And and also like Eduardo, you, you I said a, Can oh, I just say one more thing about that? <clears throat> so I think we should wait and see where we are in a year. Um, but whether the notion of uh, that distributed, whether it's at the edge or otherwise um, motif, uh, you know, actually does become dominant or not, uh, we can either make that either a particular focus within a focus session. Um, uh, you know, I don't know yet that it would deserve its own session. That may be uh, a step too far. Um, but as we look at users, for example, and use cases, uh, I think that we would want to make sure that that gets covered um, in the coming years. Yeah, I think this use case piece is, is hunting us. I, I think that's a very, very good idea for next year. But as you said, it's it's a pretty hard, no, not I maybe mean, it's not overly hard, but it's it's it needs careful pick, uh, careful pick to to be chosen for a particular segment. So uh, let's see what we come up with. Or maybe we have multiple. So let's see. Let's see. That's something that we can discuss, and we'll discuss, of course. And um, for the orchestration piece, as I said, we, we we had a focus on container orchestration, even though we talked about uh, about uh, traditional orchestration or scheduling in the in the panel. Eduardo, you pointed out yesterday that we might want to integrate uh, GitHub and GitOps and the integration of this as well. So when we talked about the UI uh, during the panel, so that's maybe something that we want to focus on as well. How can we allow users and end users to make their use case more of a DevOps workflow, GitOps workflow, so that they don't mess up and uh, have an easier way of handing over things because they have a common way of doing stuff. So applying the same DevOps pieces. Does it summarize what you what you wanted us to do next time, Eduardo? Yeah, I would love to see those use cases. And <laughs> we're saying use cases a lot, so that's a segment that we would need to include. Cool. For the HPC piece, I think what the only piece that was missing was POSIX file system integration, like shared file systems and how they are handled within um, those environments. Maybe that's also something for, for for Kubernetes and other, like how workflow managers deal with this. Are they doing it with RBAC or are they doing it in a different way? I think that's something that we didn't talk about too much this time around. So that's something that we should have next year. And kind of in relation to that, thinking about Kubernetes, you might want to bring in somebody from uh, Object Store, right? Some of the more Kubernetes native storage mechanisms and see if there's interesting aspects of that that maybe we could leverage in HPC objects or something. 
Yeah, and I have a a particular Kubernetes expert in mind who I would like to have next year. Like uh, Bob, if you're listening, I'm I'm coming for you next year again. So let's see how this goes. That would be nice. Yeah, yeah. Different ways of storing things, and I, I'm. And the same, I mean, how is it, and that's maybe something that we, we the storage piece, we want also to, to talk about your workflow discussion. I think that's, not sure if this is figured out in Argo and Airflow, or they just rely on the underlying scheduler they are using. So it's maybe something to discuss as well. All right. Where's my video? No, it's, it's there. And the last piece I think was, um, there we, we actually had some use cases, like because uh, it was Outlooks and, and use cases. So we heard about NERS, we heard about CSCS, we heard about uh, the orchestration for the edge and uh, the super containers project. So I think, and of course, the HPCW container recap from Burak. Anything as a closing segment you guys would like to, to add here? Or we, we talked about application examples already. And we also talked about yesterday, don't look at the container, but look at what I did with it. So maybe not have this biased solution architect or system architect view, but more a developer or end user view. Does that? What about, what about trying to do predictions for the year to come? So we can look back at that during the next panel. <laughs> Yeah, you want to start? It's always fun. I mean, who was right? Who was wrong? What happened that we that didn't what was not expected, or what didn't happen that was expected? Things like that. Yeah, I think we we yeah. did this right in the panel. Like, I asked, what do you think would be next? Yeah, we year? did do it a little bit, but we could make it more more formal, maybe. And and we should come back to it next year. Yeah, especially since, write them down. Especially yeah. since everything is recorded, we can easily come back to them. Okay, yeah, happy to do that. I, th I think I scribbled what people said for the next year, but yeah, I will revisit it. And then we can check what, what is the outcome. Okay, I think we don't have any questions so far. Vanessa should be on the panel. That's not a question. That's uh, okay. That's something to look into as well. Anything else we missed? Anything that comes to mind? If not, I think we don't need to make this a lengthy session. It's just to have this recap and make it public so that people, that we can even look at it next year and, and see what, what we adopt and what we don't adopt. So, Anything else you guys want to mention? One thing that is kind of tangentially related to some degree to what we're doing here is uh, virtual machines. Um, though it's kind of beyond the scope of what we have here, but there are some folks playing with, you know, really thin virtual machines and containers, allowing a container from one platform to run on another. With I don't know if that would fall in the scope of this workshop, but that is kind of an interesting thing option to handle some of the uh, architecture differences that we're starting to see within H. So micro VMs, that's what you're talking about? Yeah. Oh, like see. Amazon has their thing, right? What's it called? Um, oh, yeah, correct. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that. It might be interesting to hear a talk on that. Is the there seems like there are two aspects of that. One is the technology itself, for example, with particular offerings for different flavors of virtualization. A second thing is uh, the implications of virtualization on usage and what new or extra things need to be done because the environment that you're working on has been virtualized, which is different than an operating assumption that most people in HPC have. I wonder if it could also relate yeah. to reproducibility. Um, 
having something mm -hmm. more contained with the architecture included might lead to better reproducibility, thinking about some of that discussion. I think maybe next year, one of the things that we'll have to talk about, because I mean, we've seen problems with it over, let's say, the year to come, um, with the new the new Macs that have switched to ARM, people will yeah. run into trouble because they, they cannot run the container images anymore on their Mac because they were built for x86. So that's something that's suddenly going to come um, become more of an issue than it is now, I guess, because pretty much almost everything now is x86. There's, there's certainly exceptions. But in terms of what people develop on and what they run on, it's a good match. But it's clear that that's going to change. Um, yeah. I was thinking the same thing with some of the, you know, recent announcements, and it'll be interesting to see. It's, you know, it's much broader than just the container space, but it'll be interesting to see how the containers uh, respond to it, so to speak. Yeah, because yeah. It, it goes directly against the mobility of compute, sort of. Before you had a container image that you could run on your laptop and run in HPC, but now if HPC is x86 and your laptop is ARM, that's like broken. And it's not right. easy to fix it either. You have this container for reproducibility, but now you cannot use it on your Mac. So what are you going to do? Yeah, but there, I think, and I, I was wanted to, to talk about this anyways, uh, just uh, I think um, with the recent announcements and what Satoshi said that they work with spec and with, with build tools to make sure that the environment is correct. And I think like uh, computing environments or development environments will adopt to this as well. Maybe containers can play a role and will play a role, I guess, to make this uh, transition more smoothly. So maybe that's something that we can look at how how or did containers help to um, make the ARM adoption a little bit less painful? I, I think they could help, but I'm not sure people are doing it now. Having, let's say, having a single container image that runs both on ARM and x86. So you have two builds of the same thing next to each other in the same image. Are people doing that? Uh, well, I will say on that, though, that, that, that I've seen some, and this moves up the stack, but I have seen some Kubernetes deployments where you do specify, or in that specification, that, that there are two different uh, container architectures specified. And the system will pick what, whether you're a, like a power PC or ARM or, or x86. And it's up to the orchestrator to figure out which one to run based on the, like the nodes architecture. So the, the, those are already out there in the community as a way of doing a multi-architecture multi deployment. But you're right, we, we still need to build the appropriate container image for that architecture. And then we just let the, uh, the orchestrator figure it out and, and deploy the right one. But I think um, for, the, for the, it's not the orchestrator's choice, it's the runtime's choice in this case. So you have manifest lists and the runtime will choose the image. It will just have a common name. Well, so, so I'll go and say it is the, the, the orchestrator's choice. This is the one of the discussions that we had with, um, with Greg in that the, the orchestrator has taken on a bit more of the like the admin role and deciding which what what element can run on which resource. And if you know the architecture of the node, then the orchestrator can make that decision. Um, but you know somebody has to program it that way, but but um, that's the way Kubernetes does it today. So if you look at like the, the Multis deployment, it's it's embedded like three different types of container architecture within a single deployment and, and the orchestrator picks the right one for the right platform. Yep. The other thing is though, based on you know the VM, the you know, the firecracker and CATA containers, um, the other thing that, that, that we did a few years ago was started to look at unikernels, which is even more of a compact form of application. Um, I don't know whether we want to look at different, I don't know really what to call a unikernel. Um, 
it's 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 out there it's on the edge but i don't think many people use them today but it's an interesting technology if you really wanted to get really lightweight really purpose-built applications running you can do it with a unit kernel and and a vm and that's and you can embed the vm sort of in the unit kernel and spin them up um i think that's on vhpc uh, conference today, they're going to talk about uni unikernels again. But um, yeah, I don't know. It sort of goes hand in hand with with VMs and containers. The next logical step is unikernels. Yeah, yeah, and unikernels. So that's, I mean, yeah, that's. But as you said, not sure if this is the high performance container piece to talk about unikernels. Even though I love unikernels. Oh yeah, let's let's see. Turning to the notion of you know building on one architecture and running on a different one, kind of the issue building on your your new Mac, which is ARM, and running on an x86 system. Earlier in the workshop, we did talk about maybe using um, continuous delivery, continuous integration pipelines to submit your your recipe. And then have it build for multiple architectures within that infrastructure and that might be one solution where you have a same kind of name target but behind it you have a manifest that has multiple architectures available to um, maybe specific to i of course like that idea with the support of something like hpc but uh i also uh, acknowledge our friend Andrew, who uh, basically said um, that you may lose some in the reproducibility that you wish you would have there. It, if they that's, were still that's still reality, kind of built and built built time. Yeah, if they were still durable kind of artifacts that you could go back to, I think that that model could still work. I think there's still challenges with. Um, you know, to get optimized builds for things can require a lot of, you know, specific tuning for a different architecture, right? Both in the code and in the compilation components, right? So I think, I mean, but that might be an interesting thing to explore and just have, is anybody have a kind of working example of that? I know that's something we want to do in super containers. So maybe we'll have some updates by next year that we could show on the front. Yeah, I think that goes down to um, what Eduardo said, like with GitOps, if we would have a version and like uh, an, an artifact that can be used in different ways on different systems, then we are a long way there, right? So if we have GitOps ways of do, uh, deploying things and, and distributing things, then we can leverage this. There's, there's still going to be a lot of software. This is not specific to containers, but there's still going to be a lot of software that's problematic on our even very common libraries and packages. So what do you do when you have this GitOps uh, workflow? You push and somewhere in the cloud, your container is built for both x86 and ARM, and it fails to build on either. doesn't matter which one. What do you do? Do you stop caring? Do you go back to one architecture? Do you try fixing it? How much time do you spend on that? How much effort? So it's going to make things a lot more complex. And this is not specific to containers, but it will be an issue. And, it, and I think it's going to get worse. And as you expand the number of targets, you increase the opportunity for any one of those targets to break in a, in a very subtle way that how do you, how do you adjust your, your, your recipe file to deal with that, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of picturing you might even have different um tool chains and and build tools that you use for the different architectures right so it's you know abstracting all that out could be pretty pretty tough yeah even you, you may even be using a totally different compiler run a different architecture so then things right. get very very fast yeah right there's a very good question uh christian in the slack yeah, I was about to to get to the diversity question. Okay. If you want to do it, so there's a question of, I mean, and looking at the panel, I mean, we are all, I think, uh, in agreement that we need more diversity. We have ideas how we can improve on this next year. 
like um, or do you guys have ideas how you want to um, allow more diverse and inclusive panels? I mean, I would I recruited the panel, so I think it's always it's uh, kind of my fault as well that we didn't have more diverse. The, the question that was raised, like, what specific things are you personally doing to improve diversity and inclusion? in the HPC container community, I think the answer is very easy, not enough, and that's very clear. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here with all very similar people in many ways. But it, it's, I think it's a very difficult topic. It's not, you cannot just come up with very easy things to do that would certainly make it very more diverse, otherwise it would have happened already. But yeah, I think. By breaking it down and, and making it easier approachable and that's true for hpc in general i think making it more approachable for people uh, from any background um that's that's hopefully helping to to make it more diverse and inclusive um but of course i mean yeah what what can we do um I, i've had discussions about this with with others and one somebody made a very good suggestion that you should look in your own network, like on LinkedIn and on Twitter, who are, who are you following, who is in your LinkedIn network, and see how diverse that is. Like how many non-male or non-white male people do you have in your LinkedIn or are you following on Twitter? And many, many people have done that exercise and, and are shocked to see that it's not diverse at all. So one thing you can easily do is you can start following more diverse people, like actively try to follow more diverse people and, and get connected with them on LinkedIn. So expand your network to be more diverse. And that's already a first step in the right direction, I think. Yeah, maybe and reaching out to to organizations or um, companies in more, with more diverse backgrounds as well to make them part of projects, proof of concepts, something like that. You know? Maybe that's something that I can do at least. I think we actively have to look for it. It won't happen by itself. And and trying to make it easier somehow is probably not good enough either. Uh, we have to actively push for it. We have to actively push and also continue to provide a welcoming space for for new voices to come in and contribute, right? Um, HPC in general, but HPC can be very difficult to kind of get in um, not heated discussions <laughs> about minutia, right? Um, and I think the Slack channel that we have, the teleconferences that we have as a, as a, have been good in, in welcoming discussion and viewpoints. But I think at this point, you know, I agree we haven't done enough. And I think at this point we need to actively try to draw more folks into the conversation that, uh, a space where a lot of innovation and ideas can uh, be played around with in an interesting way, um, maybe more so than we have. In I don't have any clear answers, but I agree that we need to do more. Um, you know, one thing that may help is if we, you know, if we're trying to diversify the the discussions and include things like more discussion on applications and workflows that gives us a, a broader audience that we can potentially engage with too. So that might be another method to, to, to get others in. But I think also we have to, you know, I know like for example, Reed's talked to, told me about some of the things he's done at, you know, at LANL and in his own group to try to, um, you know, engage with, uh, minorities, women to try to, you know, get them into the pipeline because it's, you know, that's really a struggle is that we're trying to find people with experience, but you need to build that up over a long period of time. Yeah, and maybe by, as we discussed, uh, maybe by introducing people with problems rather than solutions, that might help as well that you can just, uh, that we, 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 we are not looking for applications and use cases which have everything figured out, but maybe we just invite or like we will, as a, as a, as a community here in this workshop, we will invite people that can just state their problem, maybe an interesting one, and then um, we, we try to figure it out uh, together and, and 
by doing so, maybe we are more inclusive because we you don't need to come with a solution, but you can only bring your problem. I think diversity also applies to experience. So it's not because you're new to a topic that you're not welcome in, in a workshop like this. Uh, I'm, I'm not very experienced with containers myself. It's, I'm still here for some reason. Uh, but yeah, we need to make it more broad and, and taking things from a different angle, like maybe people with a problem that have tried using containers, but it didn't work out. That could be a nice angle. Like see what went wrong or, or what could be done better to help them. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe then we need a 24 hour workshop, like for all the use cases, like to, yeah. But uh, yeah, let's see. Um, no, that's cool. Um, any Anything else on this? I think we are all aware that we need to do more. And maybe, yeah, well, let's see, like reaching out to other communities, um, other regions where they maybe also uh, need to need some help fostering the adoption of HPC in general. And maybe we can just bridge the gap of uh, traditional HPC to more agile HPC by providing assistance to just go straight to the containers instead of doing uh, traditional HPC first. Let's see. All right. Any other question in the chat? I think there's none. Any closing thought from panelists? I think it was quite fun. And yeah, just one last talk for Kenneth. So if this year everyone is talking about ARM and how that is going to complicate building software for everyone, I can't wait for next year when we're also talking about risk five and how that is going to complicate things for everyone. Again. <laughs> Yep, that's not going to help. Yeah. And I mean, we, we can see it coming, right? We know it's coming. Um, so I guess we should have it in the back of our minds and we should think about how we're going to try and come up with solutions or improvements that could make that easier because it, it is coming. Uh, we can easily see it. And change will be a constant, right? So to like use a phrase, but by making sure that we are able to to uh, move swiftly and, and adjust to new environments and new architectures. I think that's something that we should solve. And if we solve it for one shift, then hopefully we are prepared for the next one. So if we solve it for ARM, then we might have solved it for risk five as well. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not, it depends on the problem. If you have two different architectures, you can get away with a lot of simple solutions. But if you have three or four, then maybe you need to rethink what you did before. Like I, I can imagine yeah. if, if if it's just ARM and x86, uh, you just build the same thing twice, you shove it in the same container and so you let the runtime figure it out which part to run. But if you have three or four, then, I mean, the failure modes pick up, the container becomes bigger, so then you probably need something else. When, Start uh, to tie in accelerator variations as well, right? Yeah. AMD versus NVIDIA versus... PGA, yeah, vendors, things like that. Yeah. yeah. Even just looking at NVIDIA GPUs, you already have this issue. Yes, there's people with old and or cheap GPUs and the very expensive V100s or A100s. And what like what TensorFlow does, they build for a range of things. I think they build two or three different architectures, and their the CUDA runtime figures it out. That's okay if you do it for three. If you want to do it for the whole range, which is like ten, then yeah, it becomes infeasible. So you have to make choices. So maybe we need to create, oh, sorry, Shane, go ahead. I was just going to say, I do think that as soon as you, you encounter that case where your primary like development system, so your laptop, is different from your target, then that forces a lot of changes. I think that's what we've gotten complacent with is everything's been homogenous enough for most of us that that hasn't been a problem. But I think that'll be the big kind of phase change. And I agree that each additional architecture does add, it maybe means your solutions need to be a little more complex and robust, but I think that's that first step that really is um, gonna be a challenge. Maybe maybe we can come up with like the $1 million problems that we need to solve and 
use this as a guiding light to to discuss in the panel how the how the solution for a specific problem how valuable it is if we say like you need to have like 50 or 100 permutations of different architectures and acceleration acceleration devices and if let's look at the solution that was proposed in the light of if you have an explosion of architectures how how easy is it to be solved with this and Maybe we can come up with those questions where we say the use case is having five different workflow managers working in concert to finish a task and using Slurm and uh, Kubernetes in between, something like that. So can we can we solve this problem? I don't know. Or have POSIX and object store file systems because we, we want to have both have a hybrid storage system where we hydrate from the object store and use a POSIX file system because it's faster or something like that. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's something that we can do as well. Cool. Anything else? Burak, a closing thought? You were so quiet, that's unusual. <laughs> no, just, just uh, letting it sink in. Um, so in terms of uh, closing thoughts, the million dollar idea is a great one. Um, and in in previous conversations, I also heard a little more technology demonstration could be interesting. Some use cases can be interesting. So I, I, yeah, I'm really seeing this workshop becoming uh, extremely valuable to a lot of different people. Um, it's part of the challenge to keep it focused, Christian. So um, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Um, so I think what the, what we may do in the future is maybe we will have these small tracks um, that are added. I don't think we should change the current format, but maybe we add a few things to it so folks can take the direction that they are the most interested in. Some folks will be interested in the million dollar questions and try to solve those. Some will want to look at what others have built, like case studies and get inspiration from them. Uh, this is becoming very colorful. I'm so happy to be part of it. I wonder if I want to go back on the live in person workshop. I think this this uh, virtual event like provides us with a lot of freedom like to make it as long as we like, basically, and have multiple sessions. So, but yeah, we you, have will... a, you have a great point. Yeah, I'm sorry I interrupted what you what you were saying. Um, what I would recommend or say is, um, I would love to keep the online session. So even if um, you know we have the next year's in person session, maybe we add a little component of online and spend a few hours this way too. I got a lot of out of it, a lot of things out of it. Yeah. I think I would second that. Having the online component is is really nice for participation as well, right? We we're just talking about diversity and inclusion, and a lot of folks can't travel um, yeah. as easily as others, and so having an online component where people can join um, that maybe can't travel that want to and share their experiences that might be a great way to help facilitate that. And I think we can even live stream the event when it's happened. Like I think. I asked the organizers and they were fine with the idea of live streaming it, but that's maybe something that we need to discuss <laughs> offline. Um, yeah, or having maybe having a live event four weeks before the actual event and then um, derive some things from, from the, um, the virtual event so that we don't need to discuss everything in person, but we can concentrate on the panel pieces. And Sounds about right. Uh, cool, all right. Um, then I think we can conclude the conclusion. Um, thanks again for take, making the time. I mean, I, I uh, kind of threw the, the invite in. <laughs> and yeah, thanks for showing up. And I guess we will do this again soonish, next year at least. Maybe we can throw in a, a small HPCW version in, I don't know, in spring or couple of months, just maybe focusing on one piece, but that's something that we can discuss offline as well. All right, guys, thanks well, a lot. Thanks a lot thank for you, setting this up. Question. Excellent job. Yeah, thanks for all, all right. the work and setting us up. Yeah, good. Bye-bye.
Till next time.